Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast, where we talk about everything dog. Q and A's with veterinarian professionals, rescue operators, everyday topics. We cover everything dog on this podcast. So make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and make sure you're following us on social media on both Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for listening. Now here's that next episode. Welcome everyone to episode nine of the Canine Culture Podcast. We have a special guest today and we have Dr. Hansen with us. He is a vet that is also an orthopedic surgeon and he might be able to better explain that, but welcome to the podcast. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Dr. Hansen. My name is Brady Hansen. I, I did veterinary school um, two years out in Scotland um, at the University of Glasgow. I finished up at Texas A&M, so my degree is actually from um, um, Texas. I've been practicing for about 11 years now and doing, you know, orthopedic surgeries for, you know, I guess about six or seven years of that. Uh, 90% of what I do now is surgery, and that's been for about four years. Um, I kind of switched over from doing most mostly general practice and a little bit of surgery to almost all surgery now. So what does a orthopedic surgeon do in your line of work? What does your day to day look like? So I concentrate on primarily the musculoskeletal system and, and more so, um, the bones than the muscles, but it does involve, uh, you know, when you work on bones, you do have to work on and worry about the soft tissue envelope around whatever bones you're working on and depending on what type of orthopedic surgeon you are you can kind of be a generalist where you kind of do everything or you can specialize I got a good friend who is uh, board certified which I'm not and he he kind of has developed um, an interest in arthroscopy and total hip replacements and that's all he does and every once in a while he'll do something else but 95% of what he does is, you know, um, arthroscopic surgery or um, hip hip replacements. I can't, you know, not being a specialist and not working at a big referral hospital, I kind of have to um, do everything and I actually like to do everything. So you said you focus a lot on the bones. So you do you ever see any type of surgeries and and you probably do, but maybe like removing tumors or doing anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. I do a lot of soft tissue work as well. Um, and, and a lot of cancers and tumors um, are considered soft tissue, but some do involve bones and joints. And, and when they do, um, um, I do have to um, either remove them or amputate a leg because of them. Uh, I, I have removed tumors off of skulls as well, osteosarcomas off of you know, skulls or remove parts of mandibles or entire mandibles when they've had them on their jaws. Um, but yeah, so in general, uh, tumors are soft tissue, but they, they can involve the skeletal system. Okay. So what goes into, uh, an orthopedic surgery? So let's say a a patient comes in, they've got a, a broken leg. Uh, what all has to go into that before you decide that there's surgery as far as, you know, x-rays, blood work, what does that normally look like when a patient comes to you and they need surgery? Yeah, almost every almost every orthopedic case that comes in gets a physical exam, and in my experience, at least, that's the most important part um, um, of diagnosing is just examining the dog. In general, we do a kind of a gait analysis where we watch the dog walk or trot, and you know, I uh, um, now have a little bit more room to do that than I did in the the old clinic. Uh, every dog get, gets anesthesia, gets blood work, even if it's not an orthopedic surgery, so blood work is involved. Um, x-rays are probably the most important modality for diagnosing it aside from the exam. Um, we do, uh, 20, 30 dogs a day, um, worth of x-rays at the clinic. And and we now have a CT machine, which is very helpful for bone disease. If you go to special, especially hospitals, sometimes we'll use a MRI machine, but I, I don't have one of those. And I, you know, never been able to utilize that. Um, we do some some myelography, um, some myelograms uh, for disc disease in dogs or dogs that come in with, 
you know, neurologic deficits and trying to decide if it's orthopedic or neurologic. We'll sometimes use that to um, differentiate between the two. And then um, something I don't do a lot of, but I'm hoping to do more of is musculoskeletal ultrasound. They, uh, um, um, it's becoming more popular now and it's more of a specialty sort of thing, not necessarily a specialist, but, um, you know, a lot of people who do ultrasounds don't do musculoskeletal ultrasounds. They just concentrate on the abdomen. Um, some people who, who are really advanced will do hearts, um, um, or specialists, you know, cardiologists do a lot of hearts, but, um, this musculoskeletal ultrasound is ultrasounding tendons and joints and ligaments to determine injuries. And when you get good at it, you could diagnose a lot using that. So with that type of ultrasound, could you possibly avoid using, uh, the CT machine? Maybe is the ultrasound perhaps a cheaper option or do you still have to get that CT? No, it would be definitely a cheaper option. Um, you know, in regard to the CT machines, nice because, you know, it allows you to, um, create a 3d rendering of the, um, of, of the animal's bone or joint and, um, the pathology. And so you can kind of, you can see it better and in three dimensions. Um, but the musculoskeletal ultrasound, like if it's a tendon issue, um, absolutely. It would, it would be just as good as a CT, I think. Okay. And if, then with like those... I said, if, if you're good at it. Right. Right. With those, so I I know there's different ways to diagnose arthritis. That's kind of the first thing that came up, but arthritis, um, I don't know if that's something you would look for or I, do dogs get like tendonitis like people? Yeah, tendonitis and other tendinopathies like partial tears. Um, uh, I do the surgery where, you know, when dogs tear their Achilles tendon um, and, and the, muscles, the the ultrasound would be a lot more sensitive than an x-ray because you just really you can yeah you can actually see the achilles tendon on an x-ray because it's so big and it's so many different muscles contributing to that specific tendon but um you know if if you do an x-ray you can see that it's swollen or if it's a complete tear it's, i mean you can just feel that but if it's a partial tear it's hard to tell what part of the tendon's torn uh, on an x-ray and, and if it is in fact torn or not so that the ultrasound would be a lot better to use um for for, for that specific injury Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That seems a little bit different from human medicine. I feel like for us, it's kind of rare that we do ultrasounds on t- tendon tears, muscle tears, things like that. We're, we always just pop straight into the MRI machine, but the ultrasound, I mean, it sounds like it sounds much more cost effective. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot cheaper than a um, MRI, um, you know, and uh, there's, a, there's a big difference between humans and animals. And so, I mean, I wish if if I could afford an MRI, I would have it because there's, you know, I don't think there's any substitute for an MRI. And so, you know, when we go into the doctor, if we need it, um, obviously we want whatever's best for us and we have insurance and, um, you know, an MRI can diagnose almost anything. Right. And you mentioned earlier the myelogram and my understanding of that is it's a guided, uh, and I'm probably going to explain this incorrectly, but essentially under x-ray and the needle goes in essentially to try to show you where the, uh, injuries are. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's true. You inject a dye, a radio opaque dye that makes it kind of, it highlights the spinal cord, which is soft tissue. Normally you don't see it on an x-ray. You just see the bones surrounding the spinal cord. Um, and it allows you to see if there is any sort of compression of the spinal cord or abnormalities that are affecting um, the spinal cord. Um, and you can either inject it in the, um, the lumbosacral space where women get epidurals for pregnancies, or you can inject it right behind the skull in between the skull and the first um, um, uh, cervical vertebra. And it depends on if you, um, depending on where the, your kind of neurolocalization is during your exam, some dogs, whether you, regardless of where you inject it, you'll get a picture of the whole spinal cord, but some dogs you don't, so you really want to inject it in the right spot just in case you don't get a picture of the entire spinal cord. Right. Okay. Yeah. The first time I ever heard of that was actually from you. And then, um, uh, for our third, our 13 year old Stony, she has a lot of different back issues. And then I actually got my first, uh, myelogram. It was in the fall of last year. I tore the labrum in my shoulder. So that was part of the imaging series that we did. They injected the dye around my shoulder and, uh, tried to just look at the, t- all the different tears and the tendon, uh, I had tendonitis, bursitis, arthritis, you name it. And it's going on in that shoulder. So I know, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's I know a little old, bit It's kind of old school and I didn't even realize yeah. they still did it in people, but, um, it's a very cost effective way to, to diagnose, uh, this disease, or at least rule out the spinal cord. Um, when you have a dog that comes in with certain clinical signs, um, mm-hmm. 
you know, blood work, anesthesia, fluids, everything, including the myograms, only 500 bucks total. So it's a big difference than, um, you know, CT is about twice that and MRIs are a lot more. Right. So whenever a dog comes to you for surgery, what are the alternatives that you guys normally try? And I know not every case has an alternative. You know, if you have a broken uh, femur, you're probably not going to have any alternative, but, uh, what are some of the alternatives you give different patients with different injuries? Yeah. So there, right now there's a lot going on with custom orthotics in regard to either stabilizing a joint or preventing a dog from having surgery, but it is important that they're custom made for the animal and not just a generic one bought offline because those can cause some serious problems, especially with the um, vascular supply to the, to the limb that you're putting it on. Um, the, the frustrating thing is they're expensive and they're made out of material that dogs like to chew up. So if you're not careful, you can have a thousand dollar or fifteen hundred dollar chew toy for your dog. Um, and, oh, wow. and, and I have had clients who have bought, you know, custom orthotics and, and the dog chews them up. And so they had to buy them again. And so that that is a they, they are expensive and sometimes as expensive as surgery. Um, um, but there are some cases where surgery isn't an option or, or the orthotics are a better option. And we use, especially for partial amputations, um, it gives them an option instead of amputating the full leg, you can amputate part of the limb and then, you know, get a prosthesis, um, uh, depending on the disease, you know, some like young dogs and, and it also depends on when you diagnose it. But if you have a real uh, young puppy that um, has hip dysplasia, there is some physical therapy that you can do to strengthen up the, the muscles around that hip joint to uh, prevent the uh, um, dysplasia from causing as, as much issues as they grow. There's a lot of medications that we use for dogs for pain and inflammation, if, especially in mild cases that um, a lot of hip disease, I don't recommend doing surgery. And a lot of times we'll manage it with um, anti-inflammatories um, and cer- certain nutraceuticals like joint supplements or fish oils. Um, there's, there's also, I mean, it depends on how, how, how far you want to go and how much money you want to spend. And also sometimes how competent you are. So there's something called Adequan that you can give as injections. You could do that actually at home, which is a lot cheaper than going to your veterinarian every week for a shot. Um, yeah, we yeah, use Adequan, the- but I have the vet do it because I don't feel, I don't feel confident doing it, but, uh, we do it once a month right now, but, uh, we did like that loading dose when we had to go down to the vet once a week. Uh, and they were like, yeah, you could take this home with you. And I was like, I (laughs) do not feel comfortable with this at all. Yeah. Yeah. And and most of the time they do come in and a lot of times to save people money, I'll have them buy a bottle and just keep it at the clinic and we'll just swing by and get the shot. But, um, and, and there's a lot of things that don't have a, you know, studies yet, like the CBD, which seems to help with neuropathies and it's showing promise for cancers. And, and I do think it helps some dogs, um, for, um, uh, for joint pain. And, um, I don't, I'm not sure if that's just the clients, like kind of a placebo effect for the client or if it's mm-hmm. truly helping them. But, um, we just started doing PRP and stem cell therapy. I haven't really done any stem cells on joints yet, which it, it does show a lot of promise. Um, but I have done some of the platelet rich plasma, which is both of those are alternatives to, um, to surgery as well, they, but they're, they are expensive. The PRP is pretty affordable, but stem cells are extremely expensive. Right. I'm more than happy to be a Guinea pig. I've had PRP before in both my knees and both my shoulders. So if you ever need to practice, I am, yeah. I'm available. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've, the dogs I've, I've done on so far, you know, I've had the machine for about six weeks now and. Um, I had a dog with, with uh, bilateral hip dysplasia, kind of old owner doesn't want to consider surgery and um, not really responding very well to um, the uh, oral medication anymore. And we've after the first round of shots, she she the owner noticed a significant difference. And so we just did the second round um, uh, of PRP on that specific dog. But I've used the stem cells for other um, pathologies. Uh, um, I just recently used it for stomatitis in a cat, but it has nothing to do with, you know, orthopedics. So for the PRP, could you use that for, uh, like, uh, subluxing patellas or, uh, really, I guess anything where the joint is moving in such a way that it's causing inflammation or it's not tracking correctly. Could you use PRP for almost anything? Yeah, I think you can. Um, it's supposed to, you know, and then you use it more to inhibit and prevent the progression um, and to get, you know, reduce inflammation and reduce pain. Um, but it's not going to allow uh, 
regeneration and repair um, like stem cells would. You know, they're gotcha. injecting stem cells into knees now and showing that they actually can, you know, fix torn cruciate ligaments with stem cells. Um, oh, wow. And I don't know if, I don't know how, you know, what sort of post, you know, uh, injection care you need in regard to allowing it to heal if an animal needs to be strictly cage rested the entire time. I would assume so, but um, um, it's, it's kind of neat. Uh, I wish it was a little cheaper and maybe it will be. Um, I just, I just did stem, uh, that treatment on the cat and it's about 2000 bucks for the first round and about half that for the second round and each additional round is even cheaper, but it's, it's pretty pricey at least to start. Mm -hmm. How many rounds? So stem cell, uh, you didn't mention two and then recurring after that. What about with the PRP? How many rounds do you see uh, for that? I know you haven't been doing it for too long because you just got yeah. your machine, but what's the what's the protocol for PRP? So we're injecting it, and then two to three weeks later, injecting it again. Um, so there's two shots kind of right away, and you could do multiple joints or, or just a single joint. And then after that, they're saying nine months to a year, and that would be kind of a maintenance dose um, based on the animal. And, and and everything I've read is, is about nine months, but the company that um, I got my machine from is giving you a range from nine months to a year. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Uh, so back to the surgery. So what, what, what are the most common surgeries that you see on a day-to-day -day basis? I, the most common orthopedic disease in a dog is a torn cruciate ligament. <clears throat> um, and I, so I, day-to-day -day I do more TPLOs or, uh, I used to do several different procedures on knees and now I just really do the TPLO and in really small dogs, I'll still do the extra capsule repair, but, um, so torn cruciates, uh, patellar luxations, usually medial. Um, I do a lot of, I see a lot of hip disease and, and that can be dysplasia or traumatic hip luxations, which we see a lot of because of hit by cars. And so um, I do the, the femoral head ostectomy. Uh, I've done a couple other procedures in the past as well, um, to put them back in place. <clears throat> um, I don't do hip replacements, um, uh, and fracture repairs. If you're not if looking at one specific one, fracture repairs is probably one of the most common as well. If you include them all in, into one category, um, I do several, usually several fractures a day. <clears throat> and then, oh, wow. um, okay. A lot of disc, disc disease, um, intervertebral disc disease, and, you know, whether it's in the neck or the back, the backs are more common than necks, but we do both. Uh, mm -hmm. And some weeks I'll have five of them and some weeks I won't have any on in regard to back surgeries. But, um, you know, I did two, two last week. I haven't had any yet this week. So I had two dogs come in thinking they were back surgeries and ended up not being back surgeries. On an average week, we probably, you know, there's a day couple weeks ago where I had seven TP lows in one day, but oh, most wow. days we, well, you know, my goal is to have three or four a day. Um, just because it's something that I'm, I'm fast at and I like doing, uh, and, and it's something that, um, is, is really good. Um, if, if in regard to profitability, of the clinic, you know, I, I, the TP low surgery is something that I, I like to promote. And then just for anyone listening who doesn't know what that surgery is, will you, you don't have to give the actual terminology, but will you explain a little bit of what that surgery is exactly? Yeah. So when an animal tears its cruciate ligament, you have just like in humans, you have two cruciate ligaments in your knee, in your knee um, a cranial and caudal. And in humans, they're the anterior and posterior, and the, um, but they're the same cruciate ligaments and they form a cross in the knee. And um, that's what cruciate means in Latin, I believe. And, um, uh, um, dogs tear their cranial one, which prevents the tibia from sliding forward whenever they put weight down on their leg or ambulate and run around. It keeps the stif the um, stifle joint in, in place, so that keeps the femur and the tibia where they're supposed to be as they as they you know have their normal behavior. When they tear their cranial one, you get this what's called tibial thrust, where the tibia slides forward every time they put weight down. And that instability causes inflammation and leads to arthritis um, and swelling in the knee. And the pain comes from um, on top of the tibia, you have a medial lateral meniscus and they're anchored in place so they can't move. And when that tibia translates and moves abnormally, the femur actually will smash the meniscus. And that's where all the nerve fibers are. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's why it ends up being a pretty painful disease. And about 50% of the time when I do surgery, they'll actually have a torn meniscus and that's real painful. Um, 
so we go we go into the joint and you know specialists will use in general arthroscopy so they'll go in and create a little window and clean up all the torn crew shit and if the meniscus is torn you do something called a meniscectomy um if if not you leave it alone <clears throat> and then once you're done in the joint and i do something called an arthrotomy arthrotomy which i actually open up the joint all the way it's a little bit more invasive but it's it's way quicker so there's kind of a upside and a downside to it um, um it's more invasive but i can do it a lot faster than someone can do arthroscopy and um, um once we're done in the joint we actually cut the tibia um, with a circular saw rotate it and plate it in place and the the rotation is different for every dog and it's based on a specific angle that we measure and the goal for after rotation is the same for every dog. It's a certain degree that is a perfectly angled knee joint that doesn't need a cruciate ligament to be stable. So they can put weight down. It doesn't um, um, have that cranial translation and they mm -hmm. can run, jump and play and do whatever they want um, um, without a cruciate ligament. Okay. Uh, so as far as the surgeries that you see, is there a surgery that you do often that comes from a recurring injury that, you know, every time you see it, you're like, man, this could have been prevented. Do you ever see that? Or on a regular basis, there's just some injury that you're, you're you just think like, man, I wish everyone knew ABC to prevent this. Yeah. There's so the most common thing is hit by car. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's very preventable. I know dogs behavior and you leave the door open or um, they just, you know, dogs act crazy sometimes, but you know, we see so many hit by car dogs and, you know, a lot of times it is preventable. Um, uh, th there's so many things that are genetic or behavioral that can't be prevented, but, <clears throat> um, you know, certain breeds too, like, like French bulldogs, if you have one, you should keep it in a cage until it's a year old. Um, and I'm, I'm joking, but they all break their elbows. <laughs> and they, yeah. You know, every, about 80% of fractured elbows that I have are, are French bulldogs and they're, it's always them jumping off of something. And it's because they're, their anatomy is weird and puppies have soft bones and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's not a whole lot that I see that I think, uh, you know, could be prevented. Um, like you're, you're talking about aside from, um, you know, the breed specific ones or, you know, keeping your dog on a leash when it's outside. Right. I feel like one, I don't know how often you see this. I feel like I heard about it for a while, but it was, uh, weenie dogs and injuring yeah. their, their backs, jumping off of things. So I guess every weenie dog owner needs to invest in a ramp or stairs to the bed, yeah. to the couch. Yeah. And I always talk to them too, because, you know, once they have one back surgery, they're more prone to have another, you know, the higher chance of slipping another disc later on in life, but it's just so hard because they recommend there's back braces and I do recommend the, um, stairs or, um, ramps. But, and I've had clients who have kind of remodeled their entire homes and driveways to, you know, suit their, their dachshunds. But I just think a dog's going to be a dog and there, they're, there's such a huge genetic component to dachshunds and disc disease that, you know, even if you lock them in a cage their whole life, if <clears throat> they're going to slip a disc, you know, that it's going to happen now, mm -hmm. now maybe chasing a squirrel is going to make it worse or happen faster than it would have, or, uh, maybe make it, um, um, more, you know, it's, it's something that I just, I just really think that, you know, when you do look that up online, there's a bunch of recommendations. There's no strengthening exercises or, you know, uh, I've even read that some nutraceuticals are supposed to help out with it, but, you know, keep the discs lubricated more, but I don't know that it, anything, you know, if you, if you get a dachshund that, you know, is predisposed to having a disc, I think it's just going to happen, mm -hmm. but there's nothing wrong with being careful and trying to prevent it. You know, um, I do think the ramps and the stairs help because, you know, jumping off a of high surfaces is one thing you can't prevent. You can't prevent them from running around the yard, but um, jumping off your bed is definitely something you can prevent. Right. So after a dog has surgery, uh, what should most people expect for quality of life? So, you know, if an owner commits to surgery, they probably need to think a lot about the aftercare. So giving medicine, your dog eating, slinging them to go to the bathroom. So what does that normally look like after surgery for, for most of the surgeries that you do? Yeah. I mean, mo most of mine are rest is the most important thing. <clears throat> the first two weeks, getting the soft tissue to heal and preventing a dog from, um, chewing out his stitches is, is extremely important. Um, a lot of surgeries that involve joints, that two weeks is important because a lot, you want that joint to heal up perfectly. Um, it's when, when, <clears throat> when you have a joint heal up and you have to re-suture it, it's, it's really hard to do the second time. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and <clears throat> I don't like owners doing a whole lot the first two weeks besides icing and maybe some manual therapy to the leg, like range of motion and trying to help with any swelling. Um, um, after two weeks until the healing's done, whether it's a puppy, which isn't very long or um, an older dog, which takes a, uh, a lot longer of time, you know, there is a lot of physical therapy you can do depending on the injury um, to help strengthen the leg or um, promote healing of the bone, actually. Um, <clears throat> you know, too much activity is bad, but some activity is actually really good. And, and we try to, um, you know, at least educate owners uh, enough um, or guide them to places they can get more educated um, in regard to the specific disease that the dog has. Um, the, uh, um, you know, the goal with the surgery is to, depending on the injury, is to save the affected leg and make sure it's useful and in long, the long term be pain free. And, um, you know, so, some injuries, whether it's the owners didn't bring them in quick enough or it's just too bad, you know, may require long term, um, you know, medical treatment or physical therapy. And what are some reasons that a dog would be disqualified from having uh, a recommended surgery? Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the time I see is uh, um, finances is a big one. You know, if someone can't afford it, I mean, that's, that's uh, <clears throat> unfortunately a, a, a big reason that um, a dog may not get surgery. If it has, um, uh, any concurrent illness that's going to affect its life expectancy, like <clears throat> cancer, um, is a big mm -hmm. one. I've seen a lot of dogs that need surgery, but they, they, they do have cancer. They have, you know, progressed, um, kidney disease, you know, maybe it's chronic kidney disease, but they've had it for a long time. Um, you know, valvular heart disease. You know, if you got a dog that's got a really bad heart and it's not regulated very well, um, you know, that would be another, um, disease that you may not want to, um, do the surgery for, but, um, having said that, there's a lot of dogs with heart disease that we, you know, we will do surgery on. Um, an owner's inability to be compliant is also another one because there are some surgeries where if, you, if you're not going to follow the directions, if it fails, it's way worse than not doing the surgery, at, you know, to begin with. And right. um, I don't think, I mean, I do think there's some exceptions, but age itself is, you know, in general, not considered a disease. But if you brought me a 16 year old dog that had a torn cruciate i wouldn't recommend doing tpo on it um but you know if, if someone wanted to um because you know you never know that 16 year old dog may live to be 18 um so if someone wanted to do it i i, I would if it was something like that but um i wouldn't recommend it mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense well, I think that's all of the questions that um, I had for you. Thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast this evening and uh, hope you have a great evening. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. You have a good night. All right, it was good talking to you. Thank you for tuning in to the Canine Culture Podcast. Please make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform and make sure you're following us on social media. If you have any recommendations, any topics that you'd like to hear, if you know of any guests that would be good for the show, or if you yourself want to be a guest, please reach out to us. Send us an email at canineculturepodcast at gmail.com or send us a direct message on social media. Thank you for listening and please share this with any of your dog loving friends. Bye -bye.